Okay, I'd like to uh, start by thanking uh, Andy and Luca uh, for organizing such a wonderful conference and for their kind invitation. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for staying until the last talk. <laughs> and as the last speaker, you tend to be, uh, feel a little bit guilty. So I promise I will not go over time. And um, I'll, well, I'll try to avoid all the technical uh, difficulty and focusing on uh, conveying the ideals and also um, you know, um, and just tell you that what can be done. Okay, um, so I'd like to talk about mean curvature flows and sort of applications to uh, isotopic problems. And the kind of mean curvature flow uh, I'm gonna talk about is probably slightly different from uh, what you heard in this conference. So um, they are going to be, uh, how do I get a pointer? So I'm gonna look, at, look for a mean curvature flow, so actually graphical submanifolds. In a sense that um, while I look at a map well, all, by the way, all the category, uh, all the objects I'm going to talk about, they are all smooth, smooth maps, smooth manifolds. So I look for a smooth map uh, from M to N, and I look at a graph of this, uh, uh, this map in a product space, okay? So I'll, I'll, I'll draw pictures like, um, you know, um, so this is your M, and this is your N here, and you just look at a graph of, uh, uh, this, this map, and it's uh, embedded some manifold inside the uh, product space. And the, uh, both M and M, uh, M and N, they have a uh, Riemannian uh, metric, and therefore uh, the uh, product space has a uh, uh, natural, canonic, uh, natural uh, uh, Riemannian structure. Okay. Um, so the idea is really uh, try to deform the map. Okay. So this M to M here, and uh, deforming map between uh, Riemannian manifolds and by some sort of a uh, heat equation. And let me remind you, um, the first such example is actually the uh, harmonic map heat flow, which was first studied by uh, Yost and Samson back in the uh, 60s, well, in the last century. Um, so they look at gradient flow of the Dirichlet energy of, uh, um, th this is the Dirichlet energy. So DF here uh, is just a map from M to N if you look for uh, look at a differential, so from a tangent space to a tangent space, so it's like a, a map between uh, inner product space, and then you can uh, well you can write down the uh, this uh, square norm here, and then you integrate this. This is the Dirichlet energy, and you look for the uh, gradient flow uh, for this equation. And if you write down the uh, the equation, it's actually a semi-linear uh, parabolic system. So, um, well, the leading term is still given by the, uh, remount, the Laplacian on the domain manifold. But the uh, curvature on the target space will give you some uh, semi leading term. And the goal, uh, well, in the case of Yale Simpson, is to deform such a map um, to a canonical representative. In this case, that will correspond to the uh, stationary phase, which is a harmonic map between um, M and N. And you want to deform this one to uh, someone that is in its homology class. Sort of, you actually want to have a, a smooth sequence, a smooth, uh, well, it's like a continuous a family of maps. And that will connect an um, arbitrary map to a um, harmonic map in its homology class. And, well, you actually achieve great success in the case when uh, both N and N are actually uh, manifolds of negative curvature. Um, in fact, um, a lot of work was done um, you know, in, the, uh, in the 70s and the 80s. And that actually, uh, well, there are a lot of results. So, because I, I just use it as a motivation, so I'm not going to uh, talk about all these results. But those actually give you a um, very nice uh, uh, geometric super rigidity problem. So, for example, you can actually, uh, well, you look at a map from pi 1 of m to pi 1 of n. So they both have negative curvature, so they're both k pi 1 spaces. And you can represent them by uh, harmonic maps. And I will actually tell you the properties of, uh, um, I mean, how do you extend the map from the uh, fundamental group to the whole manifold, so-called uh, Margulis super rigidity uh, type result. But um, you actually tend to uh, form finite time singularity when the target manifold has positive curvature. So it turns out the uh, target curvature here, uh, curvature of the target manifold is actually very important. So you actually create a higher order term there. So if you have negative curvature, uh, the higher order term is actually the right sign. However, in the positive curvature, uh, that will often give you trouble. So I guess I'm gonna erase this. Uh, 
Okay? Um, but while mean curvature flow actually deforms a submanifold instead of uh, a map. So what do I mean by uh, deforming a, a map by a uh, mean curvature flow? So you recall that uh, while well, you can actually take any submanifold of a Riemannian manifold, then associated to the uh, uh, volume functional, there's always a vector field along uh, the submanifold, and that's called the uh, mean curvature vector. It actually points to the direction where the uh, volume can be decreased uh, most rapidly. And um, in, the in the Euclidean space case, when the ambient space is just Euclidean space, there's no ambient curvature case. If you look at the uh, embedding, that gives the uh, mean curvature flow. So it's really a, a map, right? So this is considered in just a coordinate functions in Rn. And consider a family of uh, embedding, or, or immersion is okay, uh, into Rn, that gives you the mean curvature flow. Then if you look at this uh, uh, equation, you actually satisfy this, uh, uh, this equation. So df dt is actually equal to Laplace of sigma uh, applied to f. So in this case, you really consider this f as coordinate functions, okay? And so this is really just a, a vec uh, just an Rm vector value function. And for each component, you just apply uh, the Laplace operator of the submanifold, okay? So this, is a, so, so this looks like a, a, a regular heat equation, but it's actually a nonlinear because the uh, induced metric, which give you the induced Laplace, in, in fact, depend on F2, but it depends on the first derivative. So later we're gonna see this will actually give you a quasi-linear uh, parabolic system. Okay, and, and in fact, in this case, uh, the mean curvature vector is exactly given by this uh, Laplace of F. So it's a very simple uh, expression. You take out the uh, coordinate functions of the embedding and restrict this one to your submanifold, take the Laplace in uh, with respect to induced metric and you get exactly the mean curvature vector. So this is really a heat equation uh, for some manifold. But, um, well, in the case that we want to consider, we actually consider a graphical submanifold. Right? So this is sigma here is a graph of a smooth map and sitting inside the product manifold. And, um, well, it's a, it's a graphic submanifold and this property is actually characterized by the fact that uh, if you look at the projection, okay, so, um, so this is your sigma. This is your n, this is your n. And you have a canonical projection map that maps a sigma to m. And you know by inverse function theorem, if the Jacobian of this uh, uh, projection map is actually positive, okay, then you can actually write this uh, sigma here as uh, the graph of a map from m to n. So this is an inverse function theorem. And, but some of this is a geometric property. So you can imagine that you just take a sub sub manifold here and you just move it uh, by mean curvature flow. But you, you try to keep track of this uh, projection map. Okay. And um, so in this case, we can take our sigma to be the graph of uh, this map and deform sigma in M cross M by the mean curvature flow. Okay. And if the graphical condition is preserved, then this flow of some manifold, in fact, uh, simultaneously produces the deformation of the map. So, um, yeah, if this, uh, if this is actually, um, well, but you notice that uh, in, in this case, we're not really uh, deforming the, uh, the map directly because the mean curvature vector is always a normal vector. Okay. So you're always, uh, well, maybe this is not the right direction for, <laughs> it's, well, it, well, on the way that I draw, the mean curvature should be pointed inward. But anyway, I should say it's a normal uh, vector field. So, well, you actually move this uh, manifold uh, in the normal direction, the mean in the uh, mean curvature direction. But somehow, at each time, Okay, if this uh, uh, submanifold remains a uh, uh, graphical submanifold, meaning this projection is positive, then you can actually write it as uh, the graph um, of a map from M to N, and you pick up that graph, and you pick up the map. And for each T, you're gonna get a, a map. And so this will give you a, defo a deformation of this map here. Okay. And the uh, stationary phase uh, actually give you the minimum map. So uh, you can imagine, this is just defined um, to be a map here so that a graph is actually a minimum submanifold inside the product space. So this is kind of a structure um, that actually taking into account of uh, both the domain and target. So I mean, you can, you can really consider this one as, a, as a, a, a another uh, energy functional on the space of maps, okay, as opposed to the, uh, the original energy. But somehow a little bit more symmetric because you take care of both the uh, domain and the target. 
So this is actually one that I was actually, uh, well, I, I, maybe it was considered even earlier, but what the I think I know is, is proposed by uh, Rick Rickson in the study of attached mirror spaces. So um, try to repre represent, uh, you know, the, uh, while you take two Riemann surfaces uh, with two different conformal structure, but now you try to take a, a minimum map from one uh, to the other and try to take it as a distance function between these two conformal structure. And the reason why you do this is that this is actually a sort of more symmetric way of doing that as opposed to the harmonic map case. The target is different from uh, the domain. <coughs> okay, but um, well, although, although I say, well, we, we actually just de deform the submanifold, but you notice that it's a mean curvature flow. You really just uh, uh, take uh, a submanifold here and deform it by the uh, mean curvature vector. So you can really reparameterize the flow. So this uh, flow actually carry uh, a lot of uh, uh, invariance coming from the gauge group of reparameterization. Okay. So when you really write down the, uh, uh, the mean curvature flow equation, it should be this, this equation. Okay. So the, uh, the velocity vector doesn't really have to be a normal vector. You could have some tangential component. Okay. But the tangential component really just correspond to reparameterization. It doesn't really affect the flow at all. You see, well, when you, when you evolve a submanifold inside a, 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 a ambient manifold, there's really no God-given coordinates for you to write down any embedding, okay? So, um, and therefore you can, well, for the flow that I just talked about, okay, uh, for the, uh, the picture that I just draw, okay. So although we're deforming in this direction, this is a mean curvature direction, but we can uh, somehow reparameterize the flow. So that you actually move always in the direction that is parallel to the n direction. And that will actually tell us how uh, the corresponding map is involved. And you can actually do that, okay? So you can see if you reparameterize it, so that that would really just give you the, uh, uh, what, what now you just fix a point and see how the, uh, how, the, uh, well, how the image of that point is actually moving in n. Okay? So there, these two are really just a, a gauge equivalent flows, but we just write it in a different way. But if you read, write down this, uh, 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 how this is, uh, write it in this way, so that the velocity vector is always parallel to the n direction, then you see that this uh, uh, flow actually satisfies this uh, parabolic system, okay? So df dt is equal to g upper ij, okay? And this g upper ij here is actually the inverse to this g upper ij of uh, the domain metric plus the target metric applied to uh, df so you notice that this is really just the induced metric on the submanifold. So even on a simple level, uh, this is actually a concussion of both uh, Riemannian structure. And therefore, this is a, a quasi-linear uh, parabolic system because even the leading symbol uh, contains the first derivative information of the map. And uh, if you write it down, uh, you can actually write it down as a, it's, it's again a gradient flow. But the energy density is actually this one, which is the uh, uh, area functional, okay, or this volume form. I mean, this is the, the one that you, I mean, in the, in the co-dimension one case, this is really just the uh, one plus gradient F squared, right? That's the uh, area functional for a hypersurface in, uh, in RN, graphical. Okay, so you can compare uh, the harmonic map heat, heat flow and the uh, mean curvature flow, okay? If you just consider them both as uh, uh, you know, flows for, for maps, and um, you take this df here, that's the differential of this map, it's from um, you know, tangent space at p to the tangent space at the f of p, and you pick up its singular values. So in this case, because you're remounting manifold, so both of them are inner product space, so it makes sense to talk about their singular value. Or it's really just the, uh, you know, um, well, the square is just really the uh, eigenvalues of this map, df, df transpose or df, df, uh, edge on. Okay. Then you see in this case, the uh, energy density for uh, harmonic map heat flow is actually the sum of the uh, singular values, or sum of the square root of singular values. While for mean curvature of flow, uh, you're actually using this other uh, functional here. Okay. And this i here really corresponds to the domain metric, and here it corresponds to the target metric. I just choose an orthonormal frame, so it's easier to write down, uh, and also to do the comparison. Okay, 
So, um, well, after the setup, I, um, so this is the, the basic idea um, of this um, deforming a, a map by the mean curvature flow. So let me just tell you uh, what, what can be done. So without going into um, the proof, so I just take some, um, some, uh, some results. No. So the simplest case, okay, um, will be, well, you take, uh, well, some well, familiar with the curve shortening flows on, on a two-dimensional surface. So the next simplest case will be uh, this. So um, the, you take uh, Riemann surfaces, okay? So the, both the domain and the target manual for the Riemann surfaces. And now I'm gonna choose a good metric on them. So I can just choose, uh, by uniformization, I just choose, choose the metric of the same uh, constant curvature. So minus one, zero, or one. And then uh, I just look at a map um, between two Riemann surfaces. I'm gonna assume they're both uh, compact without boundary, okay? And then look at a graph of the product space. Well, and what well, you know, you mean curvature your flow, you look for um, conditions that are preserved by the flow. Okay. It turns out there are two uh, in, uh, conditions that are like, actually quite interesting. And the first one is uh, uh, this one here. So you look at a map like this, and this map here is said to be error decreasing if there's a two Jacobian here, is that less than one. Or this two Jacobian is defined uh, in this way. So you, you have a linear map here, and you just extend to the uh, wedge product. And then you know what, what it means. I mean, it's really, uh, well, if you just take a two-dimensional, uh, you know, two-dimensional set uh, in M1, you say finite two-dimensional house major, and you just push it forward by, um, by, by F, and you look at the corresponding house of two-dimensional house of major in the target space. It simply means that uh, this map here will decrease the area. Okay. So later we, we can actually talk about, you can actually even replace this uh, two here by a general K. Okay. So when K is equal to one, um, well, this norm here, of course, is a Lipschitz norm. Okay. And in that case, you're talking about distance decreasing. But here, um, here it turns out this, uh, uh, this error decreasing is actually uh, more interesting because you allow you to uh, twist uh, uh, around your, your, your manifold. And of course, uh, F is said to be uh, error decreasing if this uh, two Jacobian is equal to one. So you take, uh, you know, the, uh, er locally the error is preserved. Okay. But there's still a lot of this kind of, uh, uh, you can see that these uh, error preserving maps, they actually form a, 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 a group. Okay. Whenever you're error preserving map, you can look at the inverse. It's still a preserving map. And this is still an infinite dimensional uh, group. And it turns out uh, both conditions are preserved along the mean curvature flow. Okay? And these conditions are actually help you uh, to prove the long time existence and smooth convergence uh, result infinity. Um, well, if you start with a, a, a map, uh, satisfy either conditions. And well, this condition can actually be a little bit uh, reformulated a little bit. Um, so if you look at this uh, M1 and M2, we know they're both Riemann surfaces, so they have a metric here. And of course, you can talk about the uh, area of form. And the area preserving condition is actually the same as uh, if you pull back the area of form here, it's exactly equal, equal to the area of form uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the domain space. And this is called a, a symplectic morphism because, uh, well, we can consider omega 1, omega 2 as the area of form. But of course, you can also consider the symplectic form on the Riemann surface. So you just preserve the uh, symplectic structure. And in, in this case, if you start with a symplectic morphism, um, then uh, it turns out all these are actually symplectic morphism. Okay. And, and therefore, they it actually give you a symplectic isotopy. But another way to think about it is actually you can consider this uh, um, sympathetic morphism group, this large uh, uh, group here, it's an infinite dimensional group. Of this uh, Riemann surface here. And then you can consider this uh, area functional, that is uh, the area of the graph of uh, a sympathetic morphism you're coming from the induced metric from the domain and the target. This is actually a symmetric function, okay? Because uh, well, as I say, if F is a sympathetic morphism, F inverse is also a sympathetic morphism. And of course, the graph of F is the same as the graph of F inverse. It's just the same set over there. So this is just a symmetric function there, and you're really trying to understand uh, the most theory of this uh, function on this uh, infinite dimensional group. 
Um, it turns out, uh, well, mean curvature flow actually give you a nice uh, deformation retract. So this is a, a result that you can prove. Um, so you can prove that the, the mean curvature flow sigma t of the uh, graph of the uh, error preserving uh, map actually uh, exists for all time and you actually convert smoothly uh, to a minimum sub manifold as t go to infinity. And the uh, sigma t at h t uh, is actually a graph of uh, sympathetic isotopy and you actually connect an arbitrary uh, sympathomorphism to a canonical uh, minima sympathomorphism, which is also a minimal map. And well, in the case of uh, when the curvature is uh, 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 positive one, of course that's a sphere case, and it turns out all these minimal maps, they are actually uh, uh, orientation preserving isometry of S2. And therefore in this case, you just deform any sympathomorphism to an element of SO3. And therefore, you can state it as uh, SO3 is actually a deformation retract of this uh, infinite dimensional group. So this is a theorem by uh, Smell, um, proved in, in, in the 70s. Okay. And um, when C is, uh, uh, this is a curvature, so when the curvature is uh, minus one or zero, so this um, Riemann surface that has genus, then, um, then it, it, what, what is proved is that you look at a mapping class group then this mapping class group is a deformation retract of the sympathomorphism group. So you can shrink every component um, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to, to a point. Okay. And well, so that's actually a two-dimensional case. Uh, so what about higher dimensional uh, manifold and is there any generalization? So, well, first of all, we will try to generalize this uh, area, area preserving condition. And as I mentioned, this, uh, uh, well, one way to interpret it is actually, uh, you can interpret it as a sympathomorphism. Okay. And there's a theorem by Osmosic. Tell you that, uh, well, if you start with, uh, uh, well, with a, uh, some, a map here, that is a sympathomorphism. So, of course, in this case, you require uh, M1 and M2. They're both a uh, sympathetic manifold. And this map here just pre preserve the uh, sympathetic form. So you pull back the sympathetic form on the target it's the same as the uh, sympathetic form on the domain. So uh, if you look at uh, sympathomorphism and you deform uh, the graph, as I said, by the mean curvature flow in the product space, then this is actually preserved. This uh, sympathomorphism condition is actually preserved. If both M1 and M2, they're Kähler manifolds, and if both of them are equipped with a uh, Kähler Einstein metric of the same rigid curvature. So of course, it's just a generalization of the, uh, um, the two-dimensional case. And therefore, we can just look at the simplest case, okay? So you just look at, uh, just assume the domain and target are both uh, the uh, complex projective space. And you just take a Fubini 3D metric, the standard uh, Kähler Einstein metric on CPM. And we can prove this uh, uh, result. So this is a, a, a pinching theorem, okay? So there exists a lambda here greater than one, depending only on the dimension, and it's actually explicitly uh, computable. Okay, so we'll just reduce to some eigenvalue estimate, and you can explicitly uh, estimate this, uh, this n here. So that if you look at any uh, sympathetic, uh, sympathomorphism um, of CPN, okay, and if you pull back the Fubini student metric on the, on the target, okay, so this is a pullback metric here, and now this is just a, a symmetric bilinear form that you can compare with uh, the metric on your domain. So just compare their eigenvalues. And if you satisfy this pinching condition, okay, then you can actually deform the graph by the, uh, uh, by the mean curvature of flow, and it will remain a sympathomorphism, and uh, it will actually uh, sympathetically isotop isotopic to a biholomorphic isometry of CPN. So at the end, um, well, you, it's, well, you start with just a sympath uh, sympath sympathomorphism, but at the end, uh, it's gonna cry um, by holo, uh, by, it's going to become biholomorphic and also it's going to become uh, isometry. And um, this result was actually known um, in when n is equal to two. This is actually a famous result of Gromo. And in that case, it, it doesn't actually require any pinching condition. So you can just take any, um, you know, simple morphism of CP2 and you can deform this one to a biholomorphic isometry. But for n greater than or equal to three, this is the first uh, known result. Okay, so um, now I want to move on to talk about this uh, uh, error uh, decreasing condition. Okay. 
So as I mentioned, the uh, error decreasing condition is also preserved uh, in the two-dimensional case. Okay, and in that case, uh, well, you can, you can, in that case, uh, uh, you can still prove uh, long time existence and uh, smooth convergence in infinity. But what about in higher cut that I mentioned? Let me just talk about one example. So I think uh, it's most interesting. Um, it turns out this error uh, decreasing condition is also preserved along uh, mean curvature flow for a map from uh, sphere to sphere. So here I'm assuming the dimension are both greater than or equal to two. Okay. And uh, well, if you take a constant curvature on a domain on a, t on a target, and then you can show that the uh, uh, error preserving, uh, error decreasing condition uh, is again uh, preserved. And so, uh, so we have this result. If you start with any area preserving, uh, area, any area uh, decreasing uh, map, so from Sn to Sm, then this map is actually isotopic to a constant map along uh, the mean curvature flow. In other words, uh, F is actually not homotopic. Okay. But you think about this, uh, this condition here. Um, well, as I mentioned, you can, you can really, uh, I think I talk, yeah, you can really uh, what define this one here. Um, in general, right, you don't have to look at the, uh, the uh, uh, error decreasing. You can look at the uh, K Jacobian. So just look at the induced map on the verge product from M1 to M2. And you look at the sub norm of this one here. And when K is equal to one, this is really the Lipschitz norm. And now imagine that, well, well, in the case when you have a map from sphere to sphere of constant curvature, well, the, uh, when K is equal to one, it's really uh, not interesting because you can imagine that distance is decreasing and your uh, sphere has radius uh, one. So if you map there, uh, well, it's not going, even going to be on two. So if it's actually uh, um, distance decreasing, it's not interesting. But uh, for area decreasing, well, even if you think about, uh, for example, you think about S3 to S2, it's whole map, okay, that's uh, sort of, You see that, well, for error decreasing, well, you can really allow to have, well, for example, take a square here, but you can actually make the image really, really long and really, really thin, okay? So you can really use this one to cover your image, uh, well, in, sort of infinitely many times. Okay, just imagine your peel of uh, the skin of an apple. Just re make really, really uh, thin strip. And you can use this one to cover your domain many, many times. But what the theory tell you that all this, uh, this kind of map is going to unwrap itself and will become a constant map. And well, it turns out after we proved this theorem, we found out this, uh, this Gromov again. Uh, PSG has an earlier theorem. Okay. So he proved that uh, for each m and n, there is this uh, uh, epsilon n m here, so that any map from Sn to Sm with uh, the two Jacobian, uh, this, or this uh, two dilation, less than uh, epsilon is not homotopic. However, in that case, this is, a, this is not an explicit constant, so uh, it's sort of by compactness results. So you only know is, uh, there, there exists this kind of uh, constant there, but it could be uh, really small. But somehow, um, yeah, and, some, and you can actually even consider uh, your general K Jacobian, and there's actually a result by, uh, by Larry Guth, uh, which is actually quite interesting. Um, I mean, well, we know that well, the, um, well, the K equal one is a Lipschitz norm, and K equal two is kind of error decreasing. But turns out there are actually homotopic non-trivial maps from Sn to Sm with arbitrary small three dilation. So no matter how small you assume the three dilation is, you could still uh, be uh, homotopy non-trivial. <coughs> okay. So I, I think that's all, um, that's all the result I want to um, say, um, but I want to raise some questions. Uh, actually, the, well, the first question is about this, uh, I guess I forget to put it down. It's in this case, uh, um, of course, we really like to uh, uh, remove uh, this pinching condition when n equal to two. And it's very likely that this kind of condition will be, will be true uh, in lower dimension. So it's very much like the, uh, so for example, this uh, theorem of smell, uh, from S2 to S2, that's actually true up to, I think it's up to S5. But S6, you already know it's not true. And the reason is because of the existence of exotic sphere uh, is in the seventh dimension. So it's likely this kind of uh, uh, theorem can be true in lower dimension. But that would be, uh, and now be interesting to prove that. 
And uh, regarding the area decreasing condition, um, I, I think I just raised uh, two questions. Well, first of all, actually, can we actually uh, sort of generalize this uh, uh, to construct some customized flow by considering other uh, energy densities that are symmetric functions of singular values of dF? You see that we already talked about two different uh, symmetric functions of, uh, of the singular value. And one corresponds to the uh, harmonic Mach-Heap flow, the other corresponds to the mean curvature flow. But there might be some uh, crossbreed of, uh, of these two flows that we actually does it for under other geometric conditions. And likewise, we may ask what, uh, you, you see, we're, we're talking about this uh, error decreasing condition. Again, this error decreasing condition can be formulated in terms of the uh, singular values, right? So the, this uh, error decreasing condition really corresponds to this uh, lambda i, lambda j is less than one, or any i is not equal to j. So this is sort of the, uh, the equivalent statement in terms of the uh, uh, singular value. But likewise, we can actually ask uh, for what kind of symmetric functions, right? Um, we can actually find a, a epsilon and m here, and so that the bound on this symmetric function, we imply this is a new homotopy. Okay, so there's this question that uh, Gromo raised actually about estimation of a new homotopy concept, and also how this is related to the uh, Hopping invariant for a higher dimensional uh, map splitting sphere or higher homotopy group of, uh, of sphere. And um, another relay, another uh, question that I. Uh, I'll raise this is really a speculation, but I found it really interesting, but I, and I really want to know um, the answer. So, um, so it, it seems that there's some, some kind of close relationship uh, between um, the uh, homotopy group of spheres and the uh, regularity of minimal surface uh, equations. Okay. Well, if you look at the, uh, the uh, uh, well, co-dimension one case or scalar function case, right? If you look at this minimal surface equation, and the regularity of this one here, uh, well, you can really, because uh, I mean, you, there's, there's a standard kind of uh, uh, blowing up ar argument. So you can, whenever you have a, a single edge layer, you can always blow it up. And that would give you some um, minima cone there. In this case, we're looking for a sort of graphical minima cone, because we're looking for a, a minima surface as a graph of F. So you can say that what is the regularity of this uh, equation really corresponds to the non-existence of a graphical minima cone. So if you actually can exclude uh, the possibility of minimal cone, and then you can actually prove the regularity. And um, well, of course, we know that in co-dimension one case, there's no uh, graphical minimal cone. But so far, um, there are actually uh, construction, um, I, I probably should, I forget, Harvey and Lawson, um, they actually construct a lot of, lot of uh, uh, examples of uh, stable uh, graphical minimal cones in higher co-dimension. But all these uh, examples are actually constructed from non-trivial -homo uh, non homotopy uh, class of uh, sphere. Okay. So um, in fact, if you look at the whole map from S3 to S2, well, you can actually represent this one here as a minimal map. Um, that is in S6. And then you just take uh, uh, the cone over X6 in R7 that will actually give you a uh, minimal submanifold. And that submanifold not only is stable, it's actually even calibrated. Okay, and these are actually strong obstructions to, um, to, um, to uh, I mean, to the regularity theorem in, uh, for minimal surface system in higher co-dimension. And um, so I think the questions that I, I mean, you can ask whether, I mean, for, for example, if, well, if, if, if somehow you can exclude uh, this kind of, uh, you can exclude the uh, uh, non-trivial homotopy cost. Can you actually prove the uh, regularity theorem? And well, in some cases we can actually do, for example, this area decreasing condition. Uh, we can actually use this one to give a regularity of solutions of minimal surface equations. Um, but um, of course, I think this is still far from um, complete. And there seems to be very, some very intimate yet uh, interesting connections between these two problems. That's uh, um, just waiting for a, a investigation. Okay. So I think I'm going to stop there. Thank you. That's why we look at this uh, sympathomorphism cost. I mean, sympathomorphism, of course, is a, is a different morphism. Sympathomorphism, it, it is, a, it, yeah, so we look at a stronger cost. But that's why I say, I mean, maybe, uh, maybe you should look at uh, some other flows. 
some other customized flow, um, you know, using other energy density. I will try to um, prove the difference. For example, this uh, Smale theorem uh, in three dimension, so from uh, S3 to S3. They want to prove that the uh, different Morbison group of, um, of, uh, of S3, orientation preserving one, can actually be retracted to uh, SO4. I mean, the proof was uh, by Alan Hatcher, but that was a really, really a complicated proof. And in the hyperbolic case, it was just done a few years ago by, by Gabay, but of course used topological method. So it would be nice to, uh, to cook up a flow that actually preserve a different morphism. But that will have to be sort of more symmetric. I don't think harmonic flow is gonna do that because it's not, uh, not harmonic is not symmetric enough. But um, my mean curvature flow is, but mean curvature only preserve this kind of sympathetic morphism structure. I don't know the uh, analog in the, uh, in the real case. 